you know, interestingly, when we get to the meat of the word and we start looking and studying in God's word, it's amazing how long you can stay in the same few chapters and the same few verses. I mean, we could, uh, we could do chapter 5 for months, you know, and just uh, draw and draw off of it. You know, I was reminded this morning how short a time that I had. I, I mean, I barely got through my notes, and I was telling uh, April that I could almost preach this morning's sermon again by the outline, but, uh, you know, the Lord... Like I said, he, uh, I've said this many times that I'll, I'll study and write out the outline and come up with the points, but when the Lord grips my heart and has me stay on one point, I'm, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I'm going to keep going on whatever the Lord will direct and lead me to do. And, you know, that's, a, that's the same thing that I also say with any kind of, of service uh, in worship. I, I also believe that even the song leaders are led by the Spirit what to pick, to sing. Uh, even those who do specials, the Spirit is, you know, everything should be done in the Spirit. And that's why, you know, I, I believe the, the, the leadership, the worship leadership is, is extremely important to the worship service. I mean, I, and I praise God, Brother Chapman, that you, you know, you choose those songs, and, but I know the Spirit's leading you to pick those songs, and and so it's, it's one of those things where I, it, it'd be like me telling Brother Chapman what to sing would be like Brother Chapman telling me what to preach. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the way that I look at it. That's the way that, that I, I look at uh, any kind of worship service and, and, and any type of leadership in the service and the worship service. So I believe all, thi all things should be done to honor to the Lord and we should yield to the Spirit. But in chapter 5, we look at the end. Again, uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through 21, but we got through verse 12 through 14 last time. Although we talked about 12 through 21, we really didn't get to, to dig in a lot in verses 15 through 21. And that's where I hope to stay uh, to this evening, this afternoon, and pray that the Lord blesses his word and teaches us his eternal truth and, you know, that we hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against God. That's the, the objective, not to sin against God, but also to praise him and to, to lift him and to bring him glory. This is one of the wonder uh, chapters. This is one of the things we read, which, again, Romans chapter 5 is is a blessing to us that we see how God and his power and his might has secured our salvation. It, it, it's an assurance for the child of God who we are justified by faith without works that it is grace alone through faith alone and through Jesus alone. And that is salvation. And in chapter 5, we see how God has mightily secured the victory. And so this is, this is a praise and hallelujah chapter. Uh, and that we marvel and we wonder uh, at the beauty of God's salvation. We marvel and we wonder at the power which God has uh, secured his salvation. That salvation, the, the way of salvation, has always been in God's mind from eternity past. That I was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the world had ever begun that God would always be triumphant over sin, and God would always had the plan of bringing Christ to die upon the cross, and to, God always had the plan that Christ would be supremely worshipped. He would be supremely worthy for the work of salvation which he secured. And so this has always been in the, the plan of God. And so I'm saved. And so how much more should I be assured in my salvation that God is able because this has always been the plan of God. And if I know that, and I see that, and I understand that, and even though I can't comprehend it, but I can believe it and I can see it, how much more should that assure our hearts that I am safe and secure in Christ, in salvation? And so in verse 15, it says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. 
For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you again. Father, we humbly come before you, thanking you for your mercy and your grace to us. Father, we ask to forgive us where we fail you. Thank you, Father, that you forgive us of our sins when we come to you in faith and we look upon the cross which your Son bled for the remission of our sins. Father, we seek to, this afternoon to open up a portion which you inspired and that you gave to Paul the right, Father. And Father, we do ask your blessings with the Holy Spirit that you'll open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts of understanding where we may see and be blessed, Father, for you are worthy, you're mighty to save. Father, we do pray for those who are not feeling well, who are sick, who may uh, not only be uh, physically sick, they may be spiritually sick, or whatever case they may be in. Father, we know that you know everyone's need. Father, we ask your blessings, your grace, and mercy upon them. And we'll lift you, Father. We'll praise you for your mighty work for your hand of healing, your hand of salvation, for all your goodness to us and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. There's going to be a few places that we're going to look, and I know last time we went through it, it may have been difficult to understand, but there's, there are some nuggets that are through here that I want to, to focus in on. There's, before we start continuing the read, in verse 15, there's this word or this group of word called much more if you see that in the middle of verse 15 much more we see the same word much more in verse 17 it says for if by one man's offense death reign by one much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ we also see the word much more in verse 20 Moreover, the law entered, but the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So we're starting to get the gist of the, what is being taught here, aren't we? That Adam and Christ are being compared at the bottom of chapter 5. That Adam's sin unto condemnation that has passed upon all men is being contrasted and compared to Jesus Christ's obedience his righteousness, and the reign of life which has been passed upon all who believe that are in Christ. So there's two dominions that are being taught here. And the dominion is the dominion of condemnation and death which pass upon all men. And then you have the dominion and the reign of righteousness in Jesus Christ which pass upon those who believe. And so right in the middle we see this word three times much more much more, much more. And so we're starting to get the gist of not only are we seeing a comparison between Adam and Christ, but we're seeing that Christ's work is better, is much more. So now the comparison and the contrast is, is look at all of this devastation caused by Adam. Much more, look at the grace of God who has caused us to reign in life and victory through Christ. And so, you know, as humans, as we are, you know, we are well acquainted with sin and the misery it causes, the sadness, the despair, the grief, the loss, the crime, the drugs, the everything, you know, I was just thinking of walking through uh, the Creation Museum, the, you know, the, the corruption part. I think it's, that's one of the C words, the corruption part where it just talks about how sin entered and everything became corrupt. And you start seeing crime and pain and death, and we're all too acquainted with that. So we know the grip of sin. We know the grip of sin and death. We know the grip of the curse. But much more will be the grip of the reign and life which we have in Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? That even though we feel this dominance of sin and death that's reigning right now, we have been born again. We've been, we've been born into Jesus Christ. So I, we're no longer in Adam, but we're in the reign and life of Jesus Christ. And so now we have and we see the victory. Now one of these days we'll experience it. And much more we'll experience it than the experiences we have now. We'll have an experience for eternity and the blessed glory and presence 
of Christ. I just, I couldn't imagine. I mean, even the angels can't look upon God and his throne and just the beauty of his holiness and glory. Uh, much more, I mean, what a, what a day that will be. And so that's a hope that springs forward from Romans chapter 5. You know, a lot of people, they start getting into theology and think theology is boring. Not if you're reading it right. <laughs> if you're reading sound truth and you're reading the sound word of God, you're going to start seeing a hope that springs up in you because you know you are based solid upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And we know that the power and the grip of God is more powerful than the power and the grip of sin and death. And that's the comparison and the contrast. If, if you're writing notes, verse 12 through 14, we see Adam, sin, and death. In verse 15 through 17, we see Adam and Christ contrasted, how they're different. In verses 18 through 21, we see Adam and Christ compared, how they're the same, but yet they are different. In verse 21, it is the, the conclusion. Uh, it is, it, it, it's a beautiful summary, verse 21, of the whole chapter, that we see Christ, righteousness, and life contrasted with Adam, sin, and death. In verse 15, as we look at this, we'll, uh, if, if we'll hopefully go by and uh, really wanted to uh, stop and study 18 through 21. But in verse 15, as, as we're bringing up the context, but not as. I, 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 really, I really would have hoped they would have put like. I mean, like reads a little bit better, but as like, you know, they're similes. If the, it's like. Um, so you can put the same word there, but not like the offense. But it means the same thing as, but not as the offense. So, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. So uh, not like the offense, which Adam did unto condemnation, so also is the free gift for. If through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So we talked about this last week for a little bit. It is both Adam and Christ are both sole, uh, sole authors of what they convey or what they send to their respective offspring. Adam was unto sin, Christ was unto righteousness. Now notice the, the word for in verse 15. Verse 15 and verse 16 read almost alike. Because at the beginning of verse 15, there's a comparison, or there's a contrast. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Look at verse 16. But not as it was by one man that sinned, so is the gift. In both verses, it talks about the gift, doesn't it? And in both verses, the next word is for. So the next word is because. So there's a contrast between what Adam did, the offense in Adam, versus what Jesus did, and the righteousness, or which is called the free gift. The righteousness of God unto salvation is the free gift, and it is by grace. So, because if through the offense of one many be dead, much more. So this is how they contrast. This is how Christ is different than Adam's offense. Christ's righteousness, Christ's free gift, uh, the grace of God by the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. We need to keep the word grace in here throughout the, the entire remainder. That it is by grace. It is only because of God's grace that we do have a reign of life. That we were offered the gift. That Christ did come and die a substitutionary death for me upon the cross. That it was by God's grace to me and not by anything that I earned it's, it's a gift to receive it's not a, a, an award to earn so that is it is given by God's goodness and by God's grace it's the only reason that we have a savior today right. it's the only reason that, that death has been swallowed up in victory it's the only reason it's through grace and so we 
also want to pay attention to the word grace, so we want to pay attention to much more, and we want to, to pay attention to the contrast between Adam and Christ, and we want to pay attention to the word grace. Notice how many times the word grace is given here. And so verse 16 reads a lot like verse 15. And not as it was by one that sin, so is the gift. Like, so like is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Okay, so he's doing the first part because the judgment was by one to condemnation. And so in the beginning of verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned. So after the word for, he is concluding what he said at the beginning of verse 16 with for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift, now he's talking about the free gift. Now he's talking about the second part of the very first sentence he said is of many offenses unto justification. So here's how this is different. <laughs> So, this is talking about condemnation versus justification. And it really starts to kick in with verse 16, and it, it keeps going from here. And so let's read again. Not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. So here's the difference. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So, not just... We see here, Christ, or I'm sorry, Adam's one sin caused a multitude of guilt to appear. Adam's one sin, okay, so let's do this illustration. You have a man that lights a tree on fire, but then soon a forest fire starts. It starts to spread. So Adam's one sin was that one tree that caught on fire, that one transgression, and then it started to spread. And then it became, so one man's offense led to many, right? So uh, in Adam's posterity, we're all born in Adam. By nature, we're in Adam. We all have a sin nature. We all have a sin guilt. We all have been imputed the guilt. And so by one man's judgment, all came into condemnation. Remember what Jesus said, that he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world was condemned already. And so if you do nothing, you're already condemned. So it spread. But not like that, not like what Jesus did. Jesus' one act of righteousness caused a multitude of forgiveness to appear. So what Jesus did, his one act was not spreading the sin, but his one act was curing all of those fires to all those who believe. So Christ's work was unlike Adam's. Adam's one offense led many to be condemned. Christ's one act led many to be justified. And so that is the difference in the comparison that we see between these two, that it's many offenses unto justification. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus Christ, one act, has paid all of my sins. Not just one of my sins. All of my sins. And Adam's one act, he has uh, perpetuated all those offenses and all of the sin guilt that is upon the human race. It's called depravity. And so we see that, again, both are being contrasted. Judgment came by one offense. One sin. Christ, once for all, redeemed. And the gift which he brings is many offenses unto justification. And so we see those two contrasts in verse 16. In verse 17, he continues, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one. So we're still talking about Adam's offense. By that one offense, death reigned by one. Much more, there's our word again, much more, they which receive abundance of grace, it's got to be by grace, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. These, in verse 17, this is the contrast of outcomes that are certain. The outcomes that are certain. For if by one man's offense, death reign by one. 
If you're still in Adam today, if you've not been born again, if you've not been saved, if you've not looked to Christ as your Savior and been born again, been saved, then you are still un, in a reign of death. And your outcome is certain. So there's a death reign by one, but if you are saved today, much more they which receive abundance of grace, it's by God's grace are we saved, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The gift of righteousness, it's not the earning of righteousness, it's God's gift of Jesus' righteousness. So that way I can be acquitted, I can be forgiven. And so by grace, God has provided the righteousness of Jesus Christ so I can be saved. So I do not have sin in my record book so that I may be forgiven. And if I'm saved and I'm forgiven, then I'm no longer under a reign of sin and death, but I've been redeemed. I've, I'm in a reign of life now in Christ Jesus. So right, like Paul, whether I live or whether I die, you know, I, it is uh, to live, I'm sorry, to, to, to live, <laughs> I messed it up. All right, here, let's turn to Philippians. I am messing up. I know to die is gain. <laughs> to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what it is, right? To live is Christ and to die is gain. So we can say that along with Paul. Um, well, thank you, Brother Chapman. Brother Chapman, help me out. Let's, let's not turn there. I'm, I'm still on this thought. So by one man's offense, death reigned. We see that. We see it. And it's a sad reality. The abundance of grace is by God. The death of rain in Adam is certain. Much more certain in contrast is the reign of life in Christ Jesus. The abundance of grace is by God. Salvation is provided by God, is provided by grace, applied by grace, and kept by God's grace. It is a reign that will never be overthrown, it is a race that will never be uh, weakened. It is a reign. It is a kingship. It's a dominion. And that there is nothing that will compete against it. There is nothing that will break me from this reign that I am in of, of Christ Jesus and of life. Much more. Much more. In verse 17. In verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So here, 18 through 21, we see Adam and Christ compared. Therefore is a conclusive statement. He's making a summary. And it, this word here, I know we've talked about condemnation but I don't know if we've actually defined condemnation um, or done a word study with it, but it is the opposite of justification. Condemnation is a legal term. It is a forensic legal term. It um, is law, legal. It, it means the sentence of a judge. The sentence of a judge, there are several usages actually of the word. Con there's condemn. And there's condemnation. There's actually damnation is the same word. And so depending on the context and where it is, there's several usages of the word condemn or condemnation or be damned or damned, but, but they all come from the same root Greek word, which is to judge in this forensic term. Now here, Romans 5.16, Romans 5.18, and Romans 8 chapter 1 there's a, there's a different word used for condemnation here, and there's an emphasis on it. This is a much stronger use of the word of condemnation. This word in condemnation in 5.16, 5.18, and 8.1, which we'll read here in a minute, this is in reference to a divine judgment against sin. And as our judge, 
This is the divine judgment. He is, he is our judge, and we are under condemnation and under just condemnation. And so this word condemnation, again, appears 12 times in the New Testament. And one of the things you need to know about condemnation, it is to eternal death. The wages of sin are death. The wages of sin are death. And here we also need to notice in verse 18 that by the offense of one, the judgment came upon all men to condemnation. All men. And so we also see, though, in contrast, righteousness of one, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And that is those whom are in Christ. Those who are in Adam are condemned already. Those who are in Christ are declared righteous, and we have life. We have justification. The, uh, condemnation is the opposite of justification. Condemnation in Adam, the judgment has come, and we are declared guilty. Justification being in Christ, the verdict has come, and we've been declared not guilty. And so, again, there's the, the, comp, the, the contrast and the compare between the both. Verse 18 is kind of a, I'm sorry, verse 19 is kind of a repeat of verse 18, but there's something really important to take note of in verse 19. It says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made sinners. Righteous, And you all may have heard me talk about this word before, but the word made there. The word made is not a creative act as God is making in me righteousness. Okay? So that word made is a different Greek word than the word create. I, I say it sometimes, but it's kathistomy. And the reason I remember that Greek word is because I'm always bringing out this point. <laughs> Here, that word made means to designate, to appoint, to constitute, okay, or to declare. So let's read this. Therefore, uh, in verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were declared, constituted, or what? Impute, constituted, declared sinners, because we're talking about what? Remember, we're talking about condemnation. And remember what condemnation is? It's a legal term. It's not an inward term. It, 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 it's not a term of character. It's a term of how you stand before the law. And so, for as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were constituted, made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be declared righteous, Amen. constituted righteous, imputed righteous, God shall declare as my judge and lawgiver me righteous because I'm in Christ. And if you're in Adam, he will declare you as guilty because that is what happened. You remember that you've got the first Adam and the second Adam, that all of men are represented by one of two men, either in Adam or you're in Christ. Either you're condemned and death is a reign over you today, or you are in Christ and you have a reign of life through Jesus Christ and His righteousness because God has declared you not guilty in righteousness unto life. We've been justified. And so now not only do we see the comparison of those two, that much more Christ's reign is stronger and more able than Adam's reign. And so it is greater. And it's only by grace. So when all these things start coming together, we start seeing the beauty and the power and the majesty of God's salvation and justification that both have a dominion, both have a grip. I once was in sin, but Jesus saved me. I once was in darkness, but God called me into his marvelous light. It was by God's power that I'm now in Christ. And now I have a reign in life. Not just in the life to come, but I have a reign in life now. 
it's a remarkable thing. And one of the things in verse 19 we, we do need to make sure we understand is that word made there does not mean an intrinsic value. It means constituted, declared, assigned. Um, verse 20 is connected to the previous verses where there was still sin in the world. And verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. There's our words, much more. And we can, well, we can, we're actually going to talk about this a lot more in chapters 6 and 7, about the purpose of the law. But where law entered, it says that the offense abounded. And so we know that when we're talking about the law, that the law uh, does not make us sinners. It declares us as sinners. And where we are breaking the law, it even more so shines a light upon us that we are sinners. And Paul's going to talk about that more and more, but uh, that is connected with verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. We're going to see in chapter 7 where Paul talks about the entrance of the law, that the law worked all manner of concupiscence in him, and that he uh, thought the law was unto life, but it actually slew him because it accused him. And so it's sin, or the law does not cure sin. It, it exposes sin in your life. Only grace and God's blood cure sin as far as the stain and the penalty goes. And so that is the only, God's blood and his grace are the only things that make an atonement for sin, not by keeping the law. Uh, verse 21, and then I'll spend the rest of the time here, it's this reign of life. So in, uh, actually at the end of verse 20, we see, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you're writing this down, this is neat. The end verse of 21 is 12. So in verse 12, it's talking about Adam, sin, and death are introduced. In verse 21, now look at this. Let's, let's read verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's a pretty grim place to stop and leave. And not, I mean, we're doomed. But look at the end verse of 12. <laughs> look at verse 21. It's the exact opposite. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And here you, you have the curse in 12 and you have the cure in 21. And you have the exact opposite. You have a reign of death in 12, but a reign of life in 21. And these two are in contrast. Jesus Christ corresponds to Adam, but righteousness it sees that it is greater than sin. Life is greater than death. And it is by through grace, in verse 21, even so might what? Grace reign. Berlin Heisel said that once God has revealed to you His sovereign grace, you see grace everywhere. Amen. All throughout the Word of God, there's just this continual layer of grace that you see over everything. That it is by God's grace we are saved. And it's, oh, what a wonderful and amazing and marvelous grace. And it's by grace that we have everything to owe God for. And, you know, when it comes to grace, one interesting thing, uh, I wrote down this from Berlin Heisel, that there is no term that is to be compared with, with grace. The, the word makes the difference between verse 12 and verse 21, death, life, sin, and righteousness. It makes a difference between, in the comparison between which one is greater, between Adam and which one between Christ. That we see that there's no word that compares with grace. 
Sin compares with righteousness. Death compares with life. But there's nothing that compares to God's grace because grace is greater than all of the power that sin could introduce, the devil could throw at it. God's grace is greater. Isn't it wonderful? We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. Uh, that he gives us grace for all our needs and all our trials. And that God loves us by his grace. And, you know, grace is getting something that you don't deserve. And we receive that. And so when you receive it by grace, there's no way you can brag about receiving God's goodness and his gifts and his grace as if you've done something to deserve it. When God gives it as a gift, it's unmerited. That means that it's unearned by me. And so he gives it by his grace. And so we have a reign in life of Christ Jesus by God's grace. And his grace should be praised. His goodness and his, his glory should be praised. God is bigger than my sin. God will forgive my sin if I repent and I ask him to. No sin is so great, no bitterness is so deep, that God's grace cannot transform your heart, change your life, and save you. By God's grace. He's ransomed us, he's redeemed us, and he's restored us all by his grace. Chapter 5 has been the blessings of justification by faith. We saw that we have experienced God's love in verses 1 through 5. We saw that we see God's love demonstrated in the cross of Jesus Christ and his great love, which wherewith he loved us, his sacrificial love that we see in the cross of Christ. And we also see the, the blessings of justification by faith as we have a great assurance of our hope because we see that God's grace is greater than all of my sin, that Jesus Christ's work of righteousness and redemption is greater than the death that reigns through Adam, that I've been born again, I've been bought with a price, I've been ransomed and redeemed by Christ, I'm out of Adam, I'm out of condemnation, but now today I'm justified. Now today, no matter what happens tomorrow, tomorrow I, I, I might get a mind disease, forget your name, forget my name, forget Jesus, forget anything, but I'm still saved by his grace because I'm justified. I've been saved because it's his power to keep me. It's his power. It's not something, you know, which uh, can quickly come and quickly go. If it quickly goes, it never came to begin with. But if you were saved by God's power, you are saved today, no matter what. No matter, like I said, tomorrow you can forget your name, but God will never forget you if he saved you and he's one of yours, and you are one of his. I just uh, love the word of God. I hope it's been a blessing to you. In chapter 8, it picks back up with the reign of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, it's interesting, in chapter 6 and chapter 7, Paul deals with the law. And in chapter 8, we didn't get to read it. But if you do, read chapter 8, verse 1, and notice how connected 521 is to 81. I mean, it's almost like it was the next sentence. So that's also a blessing to look at. But let's all stand, please. And Brother Chapman, Sister Kathy, if you would, we'll have a song of invitation. I'm